Dr. Rakowski, Harry, thanks for joining me. You know, we've been having a chance to visit with people uh, uh, over the over the time of these interviews. What's your first recollection of echo? What you know? What what do you remember about the first time you saw an echocardiogram? Well, I remember uh, doing an A mode echocardiogram, and we were trying to decide whether a patient had a pericardial effusion. There was this new diagnostic test. We had a picker machine that we were trying to use. You saw these spiky. A waves that were hard to understand, and if you look carefully, you could see that there really wasn't a separation between a couple. I thought it was cool. You know, here was a time where we really didn't have very many diagnostic tests. You had a cardiogram, you could listen to patients, and I came from Canada and, and trained under Doug Weigel, who was brilliant at clinical and bedside diagnosis, right. and that's what we had. Were you a cardiology fellow? Were you a resident? Where, where, where are we in time? At that time, I was a cardiology uh, fellow. I okay. was a first-year fellow. Okay. And uh, I decided that I was, instead of going to go into internal medicine with an interest in cardiology, that I really wanted to be a cardiologist. And I was hooked on echocardiography. Then we had uh, Harvey Feigenbaum come and give a lecture to a thoracic society meeting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, I was just really struck by how interesting this was. Right. And it was non-invasive and it had potential. How, how did, where do you go from there? In other words, so do you, do they export you to the United States? Does it put an export tariff on you and send you out? How, well, tell me what happened. Well, I, I came when the Canadian dollar was really strong, so it made it a little easier. <laughs> but after training with Doug Weigel, I thought that uh, I wanted to have a career interest, and it was either invasive or non-invasive. Right. And uh, I knew that there were a few centers in the United States where I had the option to train. And you and I were both lucky enough to train with Rich Pop, who was a tremendous mentor. And we worked with the original Varian Phased Array 2D system, which was the first commercially viable system. And you and I had a great time working in that little closet yeah. in California and discovering things. Mike Picard was just, we were talking to Mike earlier, and he was talking about, he said, I think that the first echo machine was in a closet and you were in there. I said, Harry and I were in there. You were I in a closet. Uh, I remember we were in there. It was the only place that they had room for. The temperatures got up in the mid-80s, which for those old-style machines that weren't digital was uh, not very good. And I remember we had Wayne Hillard who came and, you know, if you and I thought the machine wasn't working right, he came, took the back panel off, took out a screwdriver, and started tweaking working it until we said, yeah, the images look better, or no, you know, it looked better the other way. And people, people are used to now, you do, you know, we're all digital. Tell me a little bit about the way we recorded the images. You remember the famous I, Sanyo tape recorder? <laughs> <laughs> I sure do. It was an inch and a half reel-to-reel -reel recorder. And I think the way that Rich really decided on whether he was going to accept a fellow and whether they had the manual dexterity to be able to handle a probe was if you could load the tape on that reel-to-reel -reel recorder, then you could hold a probe and do an echocardiogram, remember, and that was the test. Do you remember that thing you had to push in and turn the knob to do something? I mean, you almost denuded your thumbs it, or everything. It, it, was it, it was brutal. And I remember um, spending countless evening hours trying to quantitate things. So now we talk about quantitation as one of the most important things that we wanted to do. In those days, you got the images, but there was no way to quantitate them. So we had this hugely expensive uh, computer at Stanford that took up the size of a large room and you had to go through about 15 steps, you remember, to sort yeah. of plug it in and you use a time-based corrector to trace mitral valve areas, something you can do now in five seconds. It took about an hour per patient to do to try and get a paper out. So it, it, it was a fun time, and we were fortunate not only to have the technology and have riches and mentorship, but to have our own friendship develop out of that time. So you go back to Canada, okay, and really introduce this whole sort of field to... Um, how did, how, did, how did it grow in Canada? You're in the premier hospital in Canada, Toronto General, uh, excellent colleagues. How did, how did that all develop? Well, I remember bringing back the machine and people being blown away by the quality of the images. Mm -hmm. Just like the first time you presented masses at the American Heart Association, you heard oohs and ahs in a way that you just don't hear anymore yeah, yeah. With, with novel equipment. In the beginning, we foolishly thought that sonographers could do M-mode echocardiograms, but they weren't going to be able to do two-dimensional echocardiograms. And I remember for the first year, year and a half, 
Uh, I did, I think, the first 2,000 surface echocardiograms. It made us better readers, but we were pretty naive in underestimating just how effective sonographers are in the everyday performance and interpretation, pre-interpretation right, of these right, studies. Right. So from that, it really evolved uh, because you show that it's clinically useful. So people right away caught on to it, and I think the better clinicians really looked at this and said, wow, I'm seeing things that I could only hear and never really visually understood, and now I can put it together, and this is so essential in my everyday management of patients that I can't do without it. You've, you've had the, you know, you're, you're not only a phenomenal physician and a clinician, but a great politician over the times, but you've, you've also had the opportunity um, to really get to know the giants in the field. Uh, I remember I, that Rich had you go to um, uh, some conference that Edler was at and all that stuff, but you, you know, Rich, uh, Harvey, Edler, what was that? Tell me a little bit about your initial visit with Inge Edler. That was really amazing. I remember um, Inge Edler came and visited Stanford, mm -hmm. and then there was a meeting in Lund, Sweden, mm -hmm. his hometown, to honor his 65th birthday, That's right. and at that time his mandatory retirement, and Rich couldn't go. And I remember going along with Art Hagen and a number of other people and, and lecturing, and I remember the kindness and the gentleness of the man. Mm -hmm. um, he came, and, and I was just a fellow who was unknown at the time, and he picked me up from the boat terminal by himself and took me to the hotel. And I was just touched by that. Yeah. He was just, I think anybody who ever knew him saw how kind and thoughtful and gentle he was. And I don't think he really understood the magnitude of what he created. Right. You know, he was a very down to earth kind of person and he had uh, an understanding that this had some potential. But he started it and he really didn't get a chance to make it the clinical, to have the clinical impact that it does now. And, and for that, we owe it to Harvey. So we really had two fathers of this technique. I think Edler and Hurst were the ones who founded it from a technical perspective. And it was really Harvey who has been the giant of this society and this organization, who is the true pioneer because he made it happen. And without Harvey, I don't think we would have clinical echocardiography at the level that we have it today. No, I think, I think you're exactly right. How, you know, how did you get active in the American Society of Echo? You know, we laughed at Here's a Canadian, uh, you know, which is obviously North, we could call it the North American Society of Echo. How did you get active in the American Society of Echo? I think I was lucky that during my time at Stanford that I met a lot of people that I stayed connected with, and I recognized relatively early the value and the importance of the American Society of Echocardiography, so I was happy to serve on committees, um, and that really makes you more interested and want to volunteer. And we've been extremely lucky in our society that we've had such a, a wealth of people who want to volunteer. So mm -hmm. I felt very fortunate. And I never really expected that I would one day uh, join the executive and, and one day become president. And I think that that still, if I look back on my career, is the time I'm most proud of. And I think anybody who's been president of this organization and we're lucky enough to meet, whether it's the past president's dinner or at other times, we share a unique bond because we understand the value of the organization and how fortunate we were to be able to give our time and efforts. And most of us continue to give our time and effort to, to improve echocardiography and to work for the organization. You and I were, were fortunate not only to be at really the, the infancy of the, of the field, but to have work with, and you've already mentioned this, sonographers. And, you know, what, and we're both, you know, we believe that they're uh, colleagues in this field. What do you see the future for sonographers being in this um, as we look forward? You know, I think that there are a number of sonographers who are worried, particularly as we go to innovations such as three-dimensional echocardiography and single-beat acquisition of all the imaging information that you might need. I think the reality is that with any technology, and you and I have seen it, that it evolves. Mm -hmm. So echo in... 2009 isn't what we thought it was in the mid-1970s. It's evolved, it's developed, it's evolved, evolved for the physicians, and it'll evolve for sonographers. So I think they're going to go from just trying to get difficult to obtain images and being proud of that to acquiring volumetric information in an effective way and then manipulating that information and quantitating it 
so that it's ready to analyze. And uh, I think that that's going to take a different set of skills that are just as bit as important. But I think sonographers are going to have to evolve with that. Their training is going to need to be altered, and their role will be different, but yet equally important. You, you, are, are you, you sound very bullish on that. Are you bullish on the future of ECHO as it, as it impacts the practice of medicine as we know it, and it will change? You know, I'm tremendously bullish on that. Uh, right now, I'm the development director of a cardiac imaging center, thanks to a donation by Peter Monk in the Peter Monk Cardiac Center in Toronto. And so I've had a chance to look at competing technologies. And two things have happened. One, I think I'm even more impressed by the quality of those competing technologies, whether they are CT angiography or MRI. Mm -hmm. But I'm also less fearful that they're going to replace ECHO. They have an important role. They have an adjunct role. But there is nothing that is going to beat ECHO in terms of being comprehensive, being able to manage virtually every clinical problem that we have, and to do it simply and quickly and in the least expensive way. So I think these other technologies aren't threatening, but they've also guided us to tell us some of the things that they can do that ECHO now needs to do mm -hmm. and the technology needs to evolve. And 3D is clearly one of those areas. And I think that uh, 3D will improve to the point that it's more robust, that on a single acquisition we can get very high quality information, we can slice and dice those images, we can do quantitation, and we can do some of the things such as color and strain that currently are a little more challenging to do, and we'll be able to do those very effectively. So I think ECHO is here to stay and is going to get stronger and stronger. You've, you've had... <coughs> The chance because you're an outstanding educator to travel the world. You know, what, how do you see ECHO in, in the world of cardiology? In other words, you've traveled to India, you've traveled all over the world. Where, you know, is, it, is it appreciated? Does it need help? What's the, what's I, th I think it's very much appreciated. I think it's appreciated in some countries more than others. And in North America, we have sonographers who perform most of the studies. Mm. And as you know, in Europe and in many other countries, it's physicians who do it. And in doing it, they do it in a different way. They may do it in a faster way, a more time efficient way, perhaps less quantitatively in, in some countries compared to others. But in every country, it fulfills the same clinical purpose. It helps you manage patients in a way that you can't do without. And that, I think, is the one overriding theme that I see, whether it's North America or in any other country in the world, People can't do without echocardiography as part of their everyday management of patients. It's absolutely essential, and if you took it away, they couldn't function properly. And the, I, I think of my colleagues who are, you know, say, "Can you just take a quick look?" You know, it's, you know, and so it's the, it's it's that they they appreciate that that value immensely. Um, if you look back over your incredible career in in echocardiography and in cardiology. Are there, and you mentioned that being president of, of the organization was a, was a highlight. Are there some other, one or two other outstanding pleasant memories that come back about the technology, the field, the individuals? I think the memories that come back are the people that you get to work with, whether they're your physician colleagues or sonographers, but also the industry partners. Mm -hmm. We've been very fortunate to have very creative, thoughtful people who have helped us to advance the field. We can apply that technology, and I think that many of us have been very good at that, but if they didn't create the technology, it wouldn't be there for us to use. Now, we keep pushing them to try and do better. We keep criticizing them sometimes for not getting products out the door fast enough or being robust enough, but in the end, they really have done their job, and they've been partners. And in these days where there's these concerns about uh, uh, the relationships between industry and organization, I remember a Robert Frost poem that I quoted once that said, fences make good neighbors. And while there need to be fences between us, uh, we have to remember the neighborly relationship and the symbiotic relationship mm -hmm. that allows things to get done and for the field to progress. Super. Well, listen, thanks so much for your contributions and for visiting with us. My pleasure. Always okay. great to see you.